We're going to be in a series in the book of Jonah. Uh, the series is called Jonah and the God that was too compassionate. As we'll see, Jonah doesn't really agree with God in this. Um, and we're going to see that over and over and over again throughout this series. But I think it's going to be important for us as we think about uh, what God desires and what God uh, wants for us and how we can follow him. So I hope this series will be effective and, and helpful for you. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 1 today, starting at, right at the very beginning. So if you want to open up your copy of the scriptures, um, which uh, I hope you have, but if you don't, we give away free ones, and it's also going to be on the screen if you don't have one. But feel free to grab a free copy of the scriptures on your way out. So many of you know that Allie and I met at Chick-fil-A. It was love at first sight. She uh, saw me walk in, gangly, you know, 17-year-old walk in, and she said, I want to train that guy. She trains me, and, and we kind of fall in love. But what you may not know is that we didn't actually start dating for over a year after we met each other at Chick-fil-A. And it really happened pretty awkwardly. I brought her out to the most romantic place that I could think of, Sonic Drive-In. Does anybody know what a Sonic Drive-In is? It's not very romantic. Uh, we got tots. We got... Um, uh, like a, a cherry limeade, and I got a, a Coca-Cola, and I sat there across from her in the middle of the summer heat, and I didn't ask her to go out with me. What I did was, is I really started, kind of, I was kind of beating around the bushes, they say. I, I, I wasn't direct about it. See, what had just happened to me a year earlier is I had had my old girlfriend break up with me. I was hurt, and I didn't want that to happen again. So the whole time I'm thinking to myself, hey, hey I, I don't want to have it happen again, so I need to make sure that she understands. So I go, hey, you know, if you don't like me, just let me know. This is how I, you know, try to ask her to date me. I'm like, if you don't like me, just let me know, and let's get it over with right now. And like, you know, you don't have to break up with me, so I'm, you know, I'm going through all this stuff. And then she says these words to me on that, after, that evening at Sonic. You're never getting away from me. <laughs> now that I think... Kind of creepy, actually, now to think about it. But she was right. I didn't get away from her. Um, uh, I went from working at Chick Fil A to working at Papa John's, and, and then she followed me there. And then we went to. Then we actually went and worked at Sonic Drive In, and she followed me there. Uh, when she got a, a scholarship to prestigious Duke University, she decided to follow me to this um, uh, n you know, no-name school in Charleston, South Carolina. Instead, um, she followed me to Raleigh, North Carolina. She followed me to Boston, and she kept her promise. I really was never getting away from her. Help me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, uh, in all seriousness, uh, I was ne we we're going to get married, and we we're going to uh, have a life together. Now, that phrase, you're never getting away from me, can, can go two ways. If you love the person, then it's a beautiful thing that you're, you're saying to each other, you're never getting away from me. We are together in this forever. If not, it's kind of stalker and serial, serial killery. You know, he puts the lotion on the skin type stuff. But um, anyway, deep cut there. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. But the truth is, is we all want security of a relationship. And we want to know that somebody is going to be there for us, who's going to never leave us or forsake us. We're not getting away. And it can be a comfort to us, particularly when we read verses like Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, which says, For the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. Or what Jesus says right before he ascends into heaven, it says, And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Or Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you or abandon you. God is essentially saying, you're never getting away from me. And that can be comforting when we're going through the most difficult times of our life. We can feel that God is there right next to us. Often as people um, go through dark times and, and I go through difficult times in my life, you know, there's that passage in Psalm 23 says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That God, Jesus walks through the valley with us. He doesn't meet us on the other side. He's with us through our difficulty. But when things are going well, and it's not as convenient for God to always kind of be there, sometimes we just wish he would leave us alone, that we could get away from him. If you ever felt that way before, you just feel like God is just chasing you down, that you can't get away, you're going to relate to Jonah today. 
Today we're going to start a four weeks journey in the story of Jonah. But I want to give you a little background before we jump into reading the scriptures. Jonah was a prophet, and he was a prophet in the northern kingdom. What happens is, is uh, in, right, so David comes along, David has Solomon, Solomon has another son, uh, Rehoboam, and what happens is Rehoboam wants to tax everybody like crazy, and so the two kingdoms say, that's not happening, and they split. And you have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Well, um, Jonah is a northern kingdom prophet. Now, the southern kingdom is known as uh, Judah, and the northern kingdom is known as Israel. And so Jonah, about 750 to 800 years before Christ, is acting as a prophet. He's hearing from God and then distributing the message to those uh, around. Now, he loved Israel. He was patriotic. He was nationalistic. And he, he actually served under King Jeroboam II. Now, Jeroboam II, what's interesting about him is he was an evil king, not a good guy. But Israel has incredible growth during that time. They prosper during that time. And so there's a place where, called Nineveh that is the capital city of Assyria. And what's going to happen is Jonah is told by God to deliver a message to Jeroboam that they are going to be captured by Assyria. But Jonah doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to deliver the bad news. He only wants to be a prophet that delivers the good news, that gets him in the you know, good graces of the king. And so another prophet, Amos, has to go deliver the bad news prophecy. So during this time, again, they, they grow and all this stuff. But there's this city, Nineveh, that's going to come in and destroy them. Nineveh is the worst place that you could think of in that time. It was the capital of Assyria. This is the place where people are uh, impaled and like they would just put their enemies out in front of the city gates. So as you walked into Nineveh, you knew, okay, don't mess with these guys. They will kill you. And so Jonah hates this city of Nineveh and doesn't want God uh, to bless it or anything like that. He, He wants it to be destroyed. And so when God comes to him today and says, go to Nineveh and preach to them that they can repent, Jonah tries to escape in three ways. He's going to escape by saying, it's not my problem. I don't have to deal with it. They're they're not my people. They're not even your people, God. They're the Assyrians. They're Israel's enemies. I'm not going to go do it. It's not my problem. Then the second way he tries to escape is through uh, piety. He's, He's going to be a religious man. And, and kind of cover up his feelings with religi- religiosity. And finally, in the last dif- ditch effort, we'll see him try to escape God through death. So let's start in verse 1. And we'll start by reading through verse 5. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it uh, to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. So what he's doing here is Nineveh is a landlocked city. He goes to the coast and he's getting out of there. He is trying to go, as far as they're concerned, to the end of the world, as far as humanly possible from Nineveh. That's what Jonah is trying to do. Because God told him to go preach to him. Verse 4. But the Lord threw a great wind onto the sea, and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. The sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone into the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. The captain approached him and said, What are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up. Call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Come on, the sailors said to each other. Let's cast lots. That is basically rolling dice. Let's cast lots. Then we'll know who is to blame for the trouble we're in. So they cast lots. And and it singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business? And where are you from? What is your country? And what people are you from? He answered, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea 
in the dry land. Then the men were seized by a great fear and said to him, What have you done? The men knew that he was fleeing the Lord's presence because he told them. So they said to him, What should we do to you so that the sea will calm down for us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. He answered them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea so that it will calm down for you. For I know that I am to blame for this great storm that is against you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't because the sea was raging against them more and more. So they called out to the Lord. I want you to notice that is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the proper name of God there. So they called out to the Lord. Please, Lord. Don't let us perish because of this man's life, and don't charge us with innocent blood. For you, Lord, have done just as you pleased. Then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. The men were seized by great fear of the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and nights. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, pray, Lord, that today you would help us with this passage that we would understand. Lord, we wouldn't just understand it and, and take the knowledge and move on with life, but Lord, I pray that these be words that help, words that heal, Lord, words that move us to be who you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that as we hear and we, we listen to these words, Lord, that this wouldn't just be a, a passive act. But it would be an active act of worship, Lord. And that in our listening and in our participation in this, Lord, we would be worshiping you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our Lord stands forever. Amen. So this devastating storm that comes up against him, and this boat is in the in the Mediterranean, kind of being tossed about like a toy boat. It, just the waves would come by, and it, it just barely gets over. They're fearing for their lives. And you have to understand, these sailors aren't greenhorns. They are battle-tested sailors. They've seen some stuff, but this was the worst thing they'd seen. They thought they were going to die, and they begin to pray. They begin praying that some God, any God, hopefully they could find a God that could help them in the midst of this. But remember, these aren't believers. These aren't um, uh, part of God's people. They aren't Israelites or um, from Judah. And so they're sitting there and they're praying. And then what they end up doing to try to lighten the boat is they end up throwing and tossing all the cargo over. You have to understand, they are throwing away their livelihood when they do that. The, when somebody gets to a point where they're willing to throw away their livelihood, that's a bad deal, right? Because you're either, either I, I go into poverty and I've never financially recovered from this or I die. And so I'm going to choose poverty over death. And that's what we see them doing. They think they're going to die, likely drown here. And God uses this storm here to get Jonah's attention, but it ends up just kind of rocking him to sleep in the boat, which is kind of wild to think about. I want to read verse 5 again. It says, Meanwhile, Jonah had gone to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen asleep. You see, he, he was escaping through not my problem. God, you told me to go preach to Nineveh, but it's not my problem. I'm going the other direction. And so the first way that Jonah tries to escape is he escapes through shirked moral responsibility. Shirked moral responsibility. He shrugged it off. Not my problem. What he had done, though, when he ran, is all the things that he had done began to fall on him and everyone around him was like falling into a black hole of his own sin. All of these sailors that were there, their lives were at risk because Jonah had done something against God. A prophet of God was running from God. It was going to lead to financial devastation. It could possibly lead to their own deaths. And Jonah has the audacity to be in the back or the bottom of the boat catching some Disease. He is both physically asleep in this moment and he is spiritually asleep. That he is not hearing God as God tries to wake him up. See, his consequences of his actions were having effects to everyone around him. And he just kind of shirked it off. You guys heard of Typhoid Mary? 
Well, Typhoid Mary uh, was a woman named Mary Mallon in the 1900s, and she is the first known asymptomatic or unaware uh, carrier of typhoid fever. And it's uh, assumed that she was born with typhoid fever and then would just carry it for the rest of her life. And by her own admission, she was a chef, and she would cook food and not wash her hands. And so what ended up happening is all kinds of people began getting this sickness from her because she wasn't washing her hands. So she'd get fired, she'd go to the next job, she'd start doing it again, and more people would get sick, and she'd get fired and go to the next job, and more people would get sick. Um, and, and it goes on and on. And eventually, she ends up being released, and then she doesn't have a job for a while, and she goes and works at a women's hospital. And again, she changes her name and everything. Again, she ends up um, infecting more people, and two of the women in the hospital died. Everything that was going on around her, she was there doing her own thing, but everybody was being affected even when she was less affected by her own illness. Everyone around her was. She ended up eventually being quarantined for life. She infected 53 people and three of them died. Well, this is known. Perhaps even more were infected and more died. And Jonah is kind of like a, a, a typhoid Mary. He's infecting people with the consequences of his sin, and he's kind of asymptomatic. He doesn't even know that he's doing it. He's completely disconnected from God, but everyone around him is suffering. And the whole boat came down with a bad case of God's wrath, which is not something that you want. So Jonah slept, and others around him caught the pain and suffering of his moral decisions. In America... In the U.S. and in in the West a lot, we like to think of ourselves uh, as morally independent. We are radically individualistic. It is kind of a characteristic of the Western uh, person that we can pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps and and, and do great things in the world. And, you know, um, that's that's fine. It's good to try to do great things and and try to um, be a great, you know, be a great person and, and make history and all that kind of stuff. But we also come to think that our moral decisions that we make only affect us. There's there's phrases that we use. I want you to finish them for me in just a second. There's phrases that we use that show this kind of moral independence, that what I do only affects me, that I don't, you know, I don't have effects around me. We say things like, you do, what's the word? You. Or we say, you only live once. Or what happens in Vegas Right. And we end up privatizing our own moral worldview that we don't think about the communal effects of the decisions that we make, that when I make this decision or I do this thing, not only may it affect me, but it can definitely affect those around me, that people around me get hurt because of the consequences of my actions, that, that the things that I do that I think may only affect me end up affecting other people too. See, Jonah shows how naive and kind of simplistic this idea that my actions only affect me. Our actions have great influence and impact on those around us. Many of you come from families where you were impacted by those around you in profound ways. We often don't take into account that society is more interconnected than we'd like to admit. Sure, you know, we can try to be that individualistic hero. But in the end, our decisions, our good ones, our bad ones, are going to affect those around us. And we like to think about the good ones affecting people, right? I want to do, I want to do good things, you know? I want to, um, and these are good, you know? Go help at the soup kitchen, help the homeless, uh, work with refugees, all these things. Very good things, and we should do them. We like to think about our good actions having implications around us, but we like to think that our bad actions only affect us, and it's just not true. The way we live moves downstream from us. So we need to ask ourselves, The question, what decisions am I making that are going to have impact on those around me, negative impact on those around me? How can I not shirk my moral responsibility to live like God has called me to live? How can I not be like Jonah? So first, Jonah tries to escape through shirk moral responsibility. But secondly, Jonah tries to escape through religion. Let's read verses 6 through 8 one more time. 
It says, the captain approached him and said, what are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up. Call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Come on, the sailors said to each other. Let's cast lots. Then we'll know who is to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots and the lot singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business? And where are you from? What is your country? And what people are you from? And this is what Jonah says. Jonah says to them, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. We see that Jonah is trying to escape through religion. Jonah is trying to escape through religion. What he says here, that he's a, he's a Hebrew, he worships the Lord, the, the one who made the heavens and the sea and the dry land and all this stuff, this is probably a creedal statement. He is saying something of worship. This is something that he probably said quite often. And he is here showing how he knew the right words. He could sing the right songs. He could say all the right things and dress the right way. He was a good guy. He was a religious guy. And he still has, in this moment, no sense that he's to blame. He is blinded by his religious facade. Yeah, God told me to do this thing. I'm running the opposite way, but surely I got things figured out. Surely, you know, God's happy with me. He thought that him and God were good. But the only people that actually understood here are the sailors. The pagan sailors understand. Those that don't worship God actually understand. Let's look at verse 10. And the men were seized by great fear and said to him, What have you done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he told them. So they said to him, What should we do to you so that the sea will calm down for us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. Often we think there's two ways to live. We think we can live as particularly if you grew up in the church, we can live as uh, Christians or non-Christians, as believers or unbelievers. But really, that's not how it works. It's not just we can live like the rest of society or we can live religiously. There's really three ways to live. Um, Dr. Tim Keller brings this up when he talks about how there's three ways to live, and, and this is how he phrases it. We can live as a heathen, we can live religious, or we can live by grace. Living as a heathen means that you're doing enough to squeak by. What you're doing is you're, you have, you, you know, you're, you're in regular society. You probably don't go to church. You're not really religious. You know, uh, if somebody asks you what religion you're part of, you might say Christian or you might say some other religion, but most likely you say, ah, not really. I'm not into it, but I do try to be a good person. And if there is a big man upstairs, I'm hoping that one day I've done enough good stuff that once I get up before him, that he will let me in. And that would be the sailors. They're just hoping to be good enough people that God will let them in. But then there's the religious people. And the religious people are not that much different from the heathens. See, they're doing things that hopefully if they do enough, they serve enough, they sing loud enough, they, they, they uh, work in the church, they go to church enough times, they give enough offering or whatever. They're hoping that one day when they get before God, they can say, hey, God, look at all the things I did. I hope this was enough to get in. I hope this was enough that I could uh, get into heaven. And really, the religious people aren't doing it because they truly love God. They're doing it out of a way to manipulate God into getting them to do what they want God to do. And that's where we see Jonah. Jonah is a religious man. It's what we see in the Gospels when Jesus is constantly talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the Essenes were all religious people doing religious things. And Jesus constantly says, that's not it. You've missed it. It's not about counting your uh, spices and making sure you tithe on your spices. Sure, do that. Tithe on your spices. But you're missing the greater point. It's about grace. And maybe surprisingly... The people that are people of grace here are the sailors. Because listen to what they understand in verse 14. So they called out to the Lord, Please, Lord, don't let us perish because of this man's life, and don't charge us with innocent blood. For you, Lord, have done just as you please. They are calling out to the Lord. 
they understand that they have no way of saving themselves. They have come to the end of their rope. They know that the, the waves are crashing in on them. The boat is breaking apart. They cannot save themselves. Their only hope in life and death is God, that God would save them. And this is what verse 16 tells us. It says that in the midst of this act of faith, please, Lord, save us. Don't kill us. Verse 16 says, and the men were seized by great fear of the Lord. That is, that is not just like terrified, which there might have been some of that going on, right, too. Because they knew what God could do with the sea and all that stuff. But they are, they are seized with a great reverence and awe of God. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. They begin to worship the Lord because they understand that it is not on their own merit that they could do it, but it is only by God that they could be saved in His grace. They recognized. They recognized that they were heathens and they needed someone to, uh, they needed God to save them. They had no hope in earning it. Their only hope was in the mercy of God. Often, religious people which I stand up here as someone who is like paid to be a religious person, right? Probably the one in the room that's the most at danger of being this. So I don't say it um, saying you guys. I'm saying this is just something we have to deal with as people. But often it's religious people that are the most blind to what God's doing it's the religious people that it can be the farthest from God. It's the religious people that cannot hear from God. It's, it's the people of grace that have trusted in God who are sitting on the boat and crying out to God while the person that is the religious prophet that knows all the right words is the one that doesn't even hear God. And it is the heathens in this case that are painfully aware of what's gone wrong. You guys know the story of the prodigal son? where the prodigal son is, um, by the way, the word prodigal means wasteful, not, uh, not, not uh, that he abandoned his father or anything, it means wasteful, but the prodigal son, it says to his dad, hey dad, I know you're still alive and all that, but I want my inheritance now and I'm going to go out. So he goes out and he spends on all the worst things, partying, women, alcohol, all the things, and, and he uses up all the money and he finds himself in a pig pen eating pig slop. I don't know if you guys have ever seen pigs eating pig slop, but it's disgusting. It's like the worst. I, every time I see a, a pen of pigs, we, we went to go pick um, strawberries, and they had some pigs out uh, there. And I looked at them, and I pointed at the, the, uh, the trough, and I said, that's what the prodigal son was eating out of. That's, the, that's how low he was. It was absolutely disgusting. And so this is where he is. He's at the bottom. He's wasted everything that his father has given them. But you realize that is only halfway through the story. There may be a better name for it is the wayward son. And we find that there's not just way, one wayward son, but actually two wayward sons. And halfway through the story, we find that there's a second son of the father who is not attending the party. And this is the reason that he gives. So if you remember the story, the son comes home, the father greets him, hugs him, gives him a ring, throws a party for him, says, my son has returned, we're going to celebrate, and all this stuff. So he celebrates him, they, they kill the fattened calf and all this stuff, and they're eating, they're enjoying life. But the second son refuses to go into this party for his brother who was once lost, but now is found. And this is what his reason is for not going into the party. He says this, look, I've been slaving many years for you, talking to his father, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughter the fattened calf for him. And here in this moment, we realize that the second son is just like the first son. All he wanted was control of his own father's wealth. And one did it through rebellion to manipulate his father through rebellion, and one did it through obedience. You might say one did it through religion. And he felt like he had earned it, and he deserved it. But what he didn't realize is what his other brother had come to realize. That all he had to do was fall into his father's arms. That's it. 
The father wasn't looking for him to do all the things and be the the best son that he could be. The father was looking for him to surrender and fall into his arms. Listen to the sobering words of the father in response to the second son. He says, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. In other words, I would have thrown you a party any day. Any day you asked it, but you missed the reason that I throw parties. I don't throw parties because you work hard. I throw parties because I love you. And the younger brother received the mercy of his father, and the older brother was left out in the cold, and he was left out there by his own doing. He's left out there because of pride and self-righteousness, that he was the one that deserved it. And we can try to escape God by being good enough, but God isn't looking for us to be good enough. He's not looking for us to do all the things and memorize all the things. And, and, and as much as you, you know, we should read, our, read the scriptures, we should go to church and all these things because we do it out of love for God. He's not looking for us to do it to earn his favor. We already have his favor through Christ who died for us in our place to mend that relationship so that we could fall into the arms of our Father and he would accept us and throw a party. God wants us to fall into his arms. Have you trusted him with your life? Jonah didn't trust God. And that distrust of God pushed him over the edge. And he tries one more escape route, not to go to Nineveh. He is so determined not to go to Nineveh, he tries to escape through death. Let's read verse 12 again, excuse me. He answered them, pick me up and throw me into the sea so that it will calm down for you. For I know that I am to blame for the great storm that is against you. He wants to go overboard. This is, this is sure suicide. He is not going to make it out of this alive. Because Jonah, again, doesn't want to go to Nineveh. It's going to work out pretty well for him. The storm stops. He dies and all that stuff. He doesn't have to go to Nineveh. doesn't have to bring this message. And this is what verse 15 says. Then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea stopped raging. Can you imagine how weird that would be? I mean, that would be just a strange thing to happen. It's going crazy, and you get this guy, just toss him overboard, hits the water, and it's calm. <laughs> It'd be so, so strange. And Jonah waits there to drown, but God had other plans. Verse 17. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. <laughs> He couldn't get away. He couldn't get away. No matter what he did, he couldn't get away. God's like, you're not getting away that easy. You're not getting away by trying to kill yourself. I will bring a fish. I'll create a special fish, some sort of sea creature to swallow you. See, the scriptures tell us the same. There's no escaping God. You can't run a million miles and try to get away from him. All of us at some point will have to encounter God and give an account for our lives. Hebrews 9.27 says, And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this, judgment. All of us one day will face God. There is no escape, not even in death. And whether we believe in Him or not, or we, we obey Him or not, or we want to see Him or not, it doesn't matter. We all will have an encounter with God one day. And we will be consumed by the inescapability of God. Period. And while you cannot escape God, one day God will escape you. And in God's final act of mercy, if you haven't trusted in him, I should, God will say, God will escape you if you haven't trusted in him. In his final act of mercy, he'll let us have our way. And he will release us to be on our own and and live for eternity without him. C.S. Lewis in The Problem of Pain puts it this way. I willingly believe that the damned are in one sense successful, rebels to the end. The door of hell, doors of hell are locked on the inside. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded. What we see is being like Jonah and trying to escape God is the worst thing imaginable. And normally, a story would end here when a person swallowed by a fish, that's kind of it. You don't really survive that uh, very often. 
Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this past week in New Hampshire, uh, off the coast, there was a fishing boat and a whale came up out of the water and hit the fishing boat and the fishing boat just like flipped over. The whales are whales, you're not going to survive that. That's normally the end of the story, but that's not what we see here. We see 14 words of grace, and I want to read them to you. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Though Jonah had failed God in every way, God still had grace. God was still compassionate on Jonah, and he was going to survive. And today, God has that same grace available to you. That same compassion is available to all of us if we fall into his arms and we trust him. Not leaning on all the things that we've done or all our merits, but leaning on him completely and just saying, God, I can't do it. I need you. If you want to start a relationship with him today, you want to come to the point of those sailors where you realize that the storm is raging around you and your only hope is to surrender to him and worship him. You can do that. In a minute, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask you if this is perhaps for the first time you've realized that you've come to a point where you desire to follow Christ. I want to encourage you to do that. And we're going to pray, and I'll, I'll give you a prayer that you can pray. You don't have to use my prayer. My prayer is not magical. You know, it's not the words. Remember I said that? It's not about the words, but it's about what's in your heart. It's about the sincerity of what, what you believe. And if today you want to follow God with your whole heart, I encourage you to do that. And you can use my words if you would like, or use your own. But today, don't let today pass. Don't keep running. Today is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for how you, you chase us down. God, so many times I have tried to get away. And every time you've shown up and you're there, sometimes it feels as though you've sent a whale or a giant fish just to swallow me up. <laughs> Lord, I pray that today, that in the midst of everything that those in the room are going through, Lord, I pray that they would see your grace and your mercy in the midst of it. Lord, you're giving us a chance to follow you and do what you say. You're giving us a chance to turn around from going our way to following you and going yours to repenting. So, Lord, I pray that today you would help all of us in this room to do that, but also, in particular, perhaps some in this room to do it the first time. If that's you today and you want to follow Christ for the first time, you can pray a prayer or something like this. God, thank you for your undeserved grace. Jesus, I trust you for your salvation. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead so that I wouldn't be consumed. I want to live for you for the rest of my life. Amen. This media has been made available by Arbor Way Community Church in Boston, Massachusetts. At Arbor Way, we invite people to walk with Jesus together. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Arbor Way Community Church, or donate to this ministry, please visit arborwaychurch.com.